Hi there. Hey. Long time no see, everybody. It's been a very odd time for all of us. I want to thank you all for coming. I know you have probably a lot of questions and I hope we have maybe some answers. I think there are some going to be some questions that we're going to be unable to answer at this point. Um, but uh, we're anxious for everybody's input. Uh, really, thank you for attending and uh, uh, we'll do the best we can to give you what information we have. Everybody's been going to webinars. We've been trying to keep on top of the latest information, which, you know, as you know, changes daily. Plus now we have riots and uh, all sorts of other things coming in as well that, uh, that the theater is going to try to deal with and uh, uh, as best we can. And uh, I think we all have, seems like we all have a lot of, uh, a lot of learning to do these days. So uh, we're trying to keep on top of it and just want you to know that. And um, uh, welcome. And I will turn the gavel over to Lisa. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of all of the things that have happened um, with the board. And you, what you will see here is sort of the evidence of the uncertainty of the time. So there's a series of decisions that the board has had to make, given that we don't really know what's next, it may have seemed like we were moving in little fits and starts, so that, that sort of a, a drip, drip, drip process of decision making. But the facts are nobody knew what this was about in the early days. So we started implementing better cleaning practices early on, and then we heard from our patrons that they didn't want to go to the theater. Their doctors had told them not to. So we said, oh, if you don't want to go to the cake, we can send you to another performance. Um, then we decided to cancel the first week or the third weekend of the cake. Um, and then met on Sunday night I believe on the 15th and determined that given that the governor was saying that gatherings of more than 25 people um, were banned, um, we canceled the re remainder of the run of the cake and we canceled rabbit hole or postponed rabbit hole. So let's see, I'm looking here because um, Katie Lindbeck's having trouble getting in. So I don't know if somebody can help her out. Um, then we decided to postpone company and um, also we canceled uh, any other rehearsals and acting this workshops the until the schools reopened. A different link for the panelists. That's the... Hi. So if, if okay, let me see. I apologize. I need like a third person um, to help here, but that's all right. We don't, I don't have that. So We'll just keep going. Um, and April 17th, we received the proceeds of a payroll protection plan loan, which is designed to um, allow us to keep our employees in place. Um, and then we, just a few days later, suspended the remainder of the 2020 season. Um, May 7th, the governor announced that large gatherings will be canceled through September. Um, and so now we've got to be at work exploring options. And that was when we eventually determined that we needed to cancel the remainder of the season and adopt a revised budget based on those actions. So next up is going to be Patrick Moser, our finance committee chair, talking about that. Can I, can I say one thing? Mm -hmm. um, between uh, March 12th and May 22nd, uh, we had 11 board meetings <laughs> for various topics. So I just want to say we, we really have uh, been trying to give a lot of consideration and thoughtfulness to, to our actions. Um, and we take this very seriously. Thanks. All right. Uh... Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, definitely one of the challenges that the board 
Um, and then the finance committee came across is, you know, uh, the Pinnacle Theater, the volunteers, the staff over the year has built a, a tremendous organization, one that very many uh, community theaters envy and the quality of our productions and our volunteers and our staff are next, um, are next to none. Um, but unfortunately, with that uh, infrastructure, we've also created um, quite a organization that uh, has some operating costs on a monthly basis um, that, you know, to maintain the theater, to have our uh, sp space downtown leased, um, some of the, uh, s the uh, septic system loans. I mean, there's a lot of different recurring monthly charges that we have about $30,000 a month of operating costs. And so the finance committee really needed to look at um, some things to make sure that we had a, a budget that balanced for this year. And it was quite, quite the challenge, depending, considering that we were looking at having to cancel all of the season. And the reason why we eventually came to that uh, decision is because when we looked at the, season, the, the shows that we had not canceled at that point, there was three remaining shows, we did an analysis of what we thought we could, or if people were to attend the theater, how many audience members we could um, accommodate based on what it would cost for that show to uh, be produced. And none of the shows um, would have produced a positive um, outcome as far as from a financial standpoint. And so from a financial, uh, although it was difficult, um, but from a financial and health standpoint, it really was necessary for us to cancel the rest of the season. And to do that, though, there was a lot of savings um, when it comes to uh, realizing the savings from the direct show expensive expenses with royalties, grand rights, um, set builds, and costumes. Another thing that the financial committee really toiled over, um, and because the staff is such an important part of our organization and um, they are amazing, uh, we uh, really had to look at um, what would be best for the theater when it came to potential furloughs. And so um, with the payroll protection loan, um, we do have a commitment to keep our staff um, employed through a certain date. Um, and so we really looked at that date, which was through June 13th, and then looked at what opportunities our staff would have in realizing some of the expanded um, unemployment insurance. And so we identified a six week period that we suggested having a partial furlough um, for a minimum operation plan for the Pinnacle Theater that would save the theater money, but also would benefit our staff in, in them being able to realize um, some, protect, some, some additional protections when it comes to unemployment insurance. And so we did save $12,000 for a, a, a furlough plan. Um, we also decided um, to terminate our agreement with, a, with um, Good Notion, our marketing company, based on um, the costs of that and to try to save some money. Uh, we did we are anticipating that our season ticket sales for next season, um, as we, you know, we'll talk more about how we're gonna select next season, but as we're going towards next season, we anticipate from a finance committee that we're going to see a less season ticket sales. Um, current, we had budgeted 45% of the house as far as tick, season ticket sales, and we reduced that down to 30% of house as an estimate um, so that we could get a, a balanced budget. Additionally, we realized that we needed to do a lot more development to make up some of the costs uh, because a large portion of our budget comes from ticket sales um, of our season. I mean, our revenue is putting on shows and we can't do that right now. So we really have made a concerted effort to increase our budget for un unrestricted donations from 60,000 to 72,000. And then we are going after some additional grants. Uh, we had originally budgeted 5,500 and have increased that to $27,500. Um, so we're looking at about $100,000 of um, unrestricted donations that we're going after. One of the efforts that we're doing that maybe some of you are aware of is um, our Sustainer Circle program. We have reached out to our donors and asked them to consider to make a monthly donation on behalf of, of Pinnacle Theater. And we've actually at this point received some really positive outcomes from that. We're hoping that some additional folks will look at um, supporting that, that Sustainer Circle. I've been talking to some folks who have donated and our community really is generous and we thank them for that um, to keep um, our operation going. And then also looking at our budget, just really looking at any cost savings that we can achieve um, throughout the rest of this fiscal year. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, 
So the next thing we, um, you know, big area of questions that we received prior to this event had to do with ne the next steps. What are we going to do in the interim? What are we going? How are we going to reopen? And we established two committees. One is reopening, um, and that has a whole set of things that we need to be looking at. And then a second committee that's out of the box thinking about what is possible in the new environment. Um, issues for the interim. What can we do to produce that will attract audiences and reflect on the quality patrons have come to expect from Pentacle? When can we reopen, which is one thing that the governor permits it, and then when should we reopen? What's responsible and what's going to be successful? So if you look here at this um, uh, illustration, Chris, could you describe what you did here, Chris Benham? Uh, certainly. Yeah, so what we've got here, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so what we've got here is I went ahead and uh, took my scale drawing of the space and then created little individual markers. Uh, each of those green circles is about the width of an average person. Um, and then there is three feet uh, additional all the way around them. So when we lay them out, what we see here is how many people we could fit on kind of a, a typical stage at Pentacle. Um, this is, uh, so this is about, I think we said it was about 17 people. Um, and uh, that's if they stand in one place and never move and are loaded in like they're going on to an airplane um, and then re uh, walk off the same way. But that's, uh, so each of those green dots represents a, uh, a, a single person and the yellow circle around them then uh, functions as, a, uh, as the safe distance barrier that they would need to keep around themselves at all times. Yeah, so as you can see, that's not theater as we understand it and as, as we do it at Pentacle. And then when you add on top of it, the problem of people projecting or people singing um, the distance that needs to be between the folks on the stage needs to be increased, probably projecting by another three feet and singing by maybe another six feet. So um, there are real challenges to reopening. Moving on here. So when we talk about the next steps for reopening, um, there, there are several areas that we have to consider. First and foremost is safety of people, um, employee safety uh, and volunteer safety. So what does that look like? It means sanitizing surfaces and that sort of thing, but also making sure that people don't show up when they're sick. Um, they need to um, stay home. And if another employee is exposed to a sick employee or volunteer, then there's going to have to be a quarantine period for both of those people. This makes for terribly difficult um, logistics. So this staff here that we have right now, we don't come into the office at the same time. We've been doing um, basically coming in as needed and no more and working remotely from home. Uh, Patron safety is another thing, and um, you can imagine the challenges of, of keeping patrons safe. Um, they are myriad, um, but the chief problem is uh, the issue of egress and, and, and ingress. We have lots of choke points throughout the theater that make it difficult to keep a social distance. And our theater itself, I didn't put this picture in there, but it, the number of patrons that could be in the theater with social distancing um, makes, um, makes it difficult to pencil out. So sanitizing and disinfecting. I would like to hand this back over to Chris Benham. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what we discussed in that group. Certainly. <clears throat> yeah, because one of the things we have, to, we have to make sure is that if we do have patrons in the theater, everything has to be uh, sanitary uh, and it has to be sterilized or sanitized between uses and everything else. So uh, we're doing a number of things uh, in preparation for that. Uh, we are installing uh, hand sanitizer stations uh, all around 
the theater uh, at uh, every uh, entrance point to the auditorium, as well as down in the lobby, the green room, uh, those places where we're going to have people coming and going, whether they're patrons, staff, or uh, uh, volunteers. Uh, the other things that we're looking at are, you know, because you, the thing is the entire auditorium, the entire lobby, the entire green room, all of the bathrooms, anything where, where the public gathers has to be completely sanitized and disinfected every time, uh, after every single uh, event that happens out there. Uh, so in addition to hand sanitizer, we have to make sure that we have proper cleaning happening. Uh, we're looking at the concept of getting some electrostatic um, sanitizing disinfecting devices that use a uh, a cleaning solution that is uh, sent out in a mist. It's electrostatically charged so that it will uh, coat the surfaces. And so it makes a larger space easier to clean. It's a it's a bit of an investment to get the equipment to handle a space our size, uh, but it's the same stuff that all the airlines are using right now, actually, um, in between flights. So those are the things we're looking at. Those are the difficulties that we have. Uh, is that the entire, anything that the public or a volunteer or a staff person comes in contact with has to be completely sanitized in order for us to maintain that safe environment for everyone. Another challenge we have is our parking lot. Um, one of the things that has been suggested by experts is that you kill every other parking spot in order to ensure people can safely get in and out of their cars um, without invading the social distance limits. Uh, you can imagine what how that would affect um, attendance uh, if we do that. I addressed a little bit earlier the access points. Um, one of the things that we are working on is, okay, so say we reopen, where will the hospitality guild come and check in? And what are we going to do? Are we going to take their temperature? You know, are we going to talk to them if they're coughing? Are we going to send them home? This is a much higher level of um, engagement with the volunteers in terms of uh, before they even enter the space. Similarly, with um, the, the cast and crew, not only at the theater, but in the rehearsal space. Um, we have super challenges with the backstage area, the green room, passing on the stairs many, many things that we need to take into consideration as we consider reopening. I addressed the seating already. Um, concessions is another key area um, and, and uh, area of risk. And it sort of is pushing us to maybe not having intermissions, metering uh, entrance to uh, the access to the bar and to the coffee area, um, maybe doing a similar thing with the bathrooms. You know, at, which is a challenge in the best of circumstances. The ladies line is always long and out the door. Uh, um, we're gonna have to control that access to the bathroom if we open before there's a vaccine or a vi vi viable um, treatment for this virus. And finally, um, we need to work on consistency about communication. I think the most important thing that we need to communicate is that we are taking the health of our volunteers very seriously the health of our patrons very seriously. And when you have patrons like we have who are elderly, I just got a letter today, I'll, I'll read it to you. Since we're old, we won't attend the theater until there is a vaccine or an effective antiviral drug. We hope that will happen soon so that we can go to plays in 2021. I'm enclosing our tickets for the rest of 2020 as a donation along with a financial contribution of $1,000 to help keep Pentacle Theater in business. Stay well. But that's what we're hearing from a lot of our patrons. It's a real mixed bag. But um, those older patrons were already calling us and saying, my doctor told me not to go um, before we close the cake. So we have to reassure them that we're doing everything in our power to keep them safe. And another um, thing that we need to look at is the whole hospitality interaction at the door. Um, how do we reduce physical contact? Are we going to be handing out programs? Are we going to be recycling the programs? Are we going to be taking tickets? These are all things that we need to find answers to. So, of course, that's just one aspect of reopening. The next one is what do we reopen with? And this is for John Stuber to take. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, before I dive into this, I, I'd like to take a second to thank our Play Reading Committee, our PRC, 
Uh, they've done some incredible work so far, especially under the circumstances that we're under now. Um, I'd like to thank Kate Thomas, the chair, uh, and then also her members, Claire Schneider, Ellie Knoll, Emily Loberg, Emma Thurston, Holly Giesbrecht, and Laura Davis. We all appreciate the work that you've done so far and the work that you're gonna continue to do. So just uh, to re reiterate part of the timeline as it uh, refers to all of us in the theater as well as our P PRC, we did meet January 11th for an initial kickoff for the director's meeting. And in the month of February, the PRC worked diligently to contact potential directors they collected ideas, read scripts, and thought about what our season would start to look like. Also in February, Lisa, as our executive director, solicited and collected uh, proposals for the fundraiser and musicals. On March 1st, the board and the PRC and the executive director heard the musical and fundraiser proposals, and we began to deliberate how those would fit into our 2021 season. And on March 11th, as we all know, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 pandemic. And two days later, we were under a national emergency, which was declared. So at that point, uh, I like to call it the board, the executive director and the staff, we all went into triage mode. We had some difficult decisions to make. Um, and those included, of course, closing the run of the cake. Uh, we canceled She Kills Monsters. We suspended the rest of the season, postponing Rabbit Hole and Company. At that time, we tried to move from triage mode to active mode, and we knew that we needed to be creative in our decisions. We needed to make some tough decisions, but we knew that we could confidently move forward and we would come out better on the other end. So the Finance Committee met, we adjusted the budget, we applied for a PPP loan, and then we adjusted the season selection timeline with the help of the, of the PRC. And our goals for, were, for adjusting the timeline were to give the theater a greater financial stability, to continue to engage all of our volunteers, and our, our goal to, uh, as always, to attract the largest possible audience to, to our uh, creative endeavors. The new directives that we came up with, uh, that, that the PRC and board created uh, for the plan, we wanted to collaborate closer between the PRC and the, uh, and the board in selecting the uh, season process. And we also wanted to give a priority to shows that had high name recognition. They would have low production costs and also have a high audience appeal. And then we also wanted to give our PRC and our interested directors an extended timeline because we needed to start thinking outside of the box because we're looking at different criteria and the circumstances. So we, extended the proposal deadline to, to May 18th. So in the meantime, the board and the PRC are we're vetting these ideas. The PRC is reading new plays, are continuing to research and find creative ways of how we can produce uh, theater in the coming months. So I think I have probably addressed all of the uh, things on the orange thing, uncertainty. Uncertainty is our buzzword. Uh, we don't know what, what it's gonna look like, but we are, we are gonna be creative. We're gonna think outside of the box. We do have several uh, task forces that are looking at this and, and trying to come up with how we can survive and how we can create. Um, cast size, of course, will probably have to be small as we saw in Chris's uh, rendering. Royalties, we're gonna try to find uh, works that are a little bit lower cost than what you would normally see. Uh, of course, as I had mentioned before, we want to have a wide interest in the productions to a wide audience. The production costs, of course, need to be low. And of course, the risks we've addressed uh, with, the, with the spread of the COVID-19 need to be very careful about cast and crew <clears throat> in, our, in our circumstances and how we can handle that best. And then the really fun one, the number seven, the problem with singing, um, as, a, as a general rule for any sort of respiratory virus, you can always say that silence is safer than whispering, whispering is safer than talking, and talking is safer than singing. So the singing is the real culprit here. It can be considered as a super spreader. And we all know the infamous case that happened in Washington State, where, that, that choir rehearsal where the person came, feeling bad with some flu-like symptoms, and then a couple of days later, or a couple of weeks later, there were two of the members that had uh, that died, as well as I think it was 53 of the 61 choir members uh, came back and tested positive for the coronavirus. So the singing is is 
it can contribute to a, a lot of the spread of, of, uh, of the COVID-19. <clears throat> and a way to think about that is, is when you sing, uh, you expand a lot of uh, microscopic particles when you're projecting or when you're singing. And the COVID-19 virus is thought to uh, attach to these particles and possibly mutate and, and, and replicate from the particles. The particles, the larger particles can drop to the floor, but there's a good portion of those particles that will stay airborne and they can stay airborne for up to an hour or so and can possibly move more than six feet. So these particles kind of linger in the air and that remains uh, to be a, a rather unsafe situation. So the, the experts say that the exact danger of the aerosolized virus, it's unclear, but since choir re rehearsals and anything music rehearsals are uh, proving to be clearly risky, it's a safe default to assume that these particles are gonna be floating around and they could possibly get you sick. So what we're seeing from a lot of the experts, American Choral Director Associations, a lot of theater companies as well on Broadway, they're advising that we not get together and sing in person until a vaccine is, or some sort of treatment is, is becoming widely available. So again, this, our, our keyword is uncertain, uh, but we are trying to be creative and come up with new ways of how we can work with this. If that means uh, a, a drive-in play or whatever, <clears throat> we're excited about the possibilities of what we can possibly bring to, bring to our audience. And with that, I'll kick it back to Lisa. Well, it's interesting. I don't see any questions here in the queue. So the, now is the time. If you have a question, to post it in there. But I can say that we did he hear um, from one of the people who's attending this, um, what are we planning to do about our rehearsal space? Um, and we already know that our rehearsal space uh, has an inadequate HVAC system for large groups. And we all know if you've ever been in a show, especially a musical, uh, that illness runs rampant. And, I, and I'll hearken back to when I was in Young Frankenstein where literally codeine was being passed around the, the green room <laughs> because everybody was sick. Um, and so that's just a reality that we already face. And uh, it's easier to clean it now, thanks to the efforts of John Stuber and others who put in, you know, new floors and that sort of thing. But the reality is, is that um, it isn't a good, good environment for rehearsing um, in these conditions. And uh, particularly when you add dancing to the singing and then people are even breathing more heavily and they're sucking in more air, um, it's, it's going to make, people are gonna get sick in that environment. So, um, it just so happens that our lease is up in March and um, our landlord here does not want to renew our lease. So we're on the hunt for a new office space and rehearsal spaces. And that may be a great opportunity for us to improve the health um, conditions in our rehearsal area. Did that answer your question, Tom Hewitt? Um, let's see. So we addressed the other questions about are we going to, how we're gonna choose the season. I think that the, the question, um, <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, uh, in any case, um, the season selection, are we gonna have a season that starts in January? Who wants to take that one? John? He left. Sorry, I was <clears throat> trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> okay. Uh, what we're planning on is, is hopefully having some sort of a season uh, possibly selected by September. But again, all of this is very uncertain. We're going to move forward with what ideas percolate to the top and how that manifests itself. It's going to be, some, it's going to be something different than what we've seen before, but we're hoping that we might have something by September 4th. Uh, it's, that's, was our all, everything's working together and everything is, is, is rosy and bright and sunny and, and it can work. That may be pushed back or pushed out a little bit, but we're, we're, look, we're aiming for uh, some sort of season selection by September 4th. But again, uncertainty is the buzzword here. We're gonna try for that, but we are uncertain. 
Okay, we got a question here. Thinking outside the box, if this is our new reality, should we research using some of our land to create an outdoor theater? Anybody want to try that one on? Hmm. Well, speaking, <clears throat> I'll just throw in a real quick thing there about that. Uh, there's, uh, there has been some minor talk about that. Uh, the difficulty with that is um, going to be expense at this point uh, in a time when we're already uh, have budgetary restrictions. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, plus you get into zoning and everything else. I'm doing some sort of outdoor production is not necessarily a, a, a crazy thought, but I don't know how much sense it would make for us at this point to do a major investment in an actual additional infrastructure to support it. Uh, and yes, it might be good to start the process. So that might be our outside the box group plus our facilities group um, talking about what that might look like. Okay, Robert Salberg asks, you mentioned two committees helping to move things forward. How do we participate? So, I guess I'll, I'll take this one. Um, which committee interests you? Uh, we do all our meetings via Zoom and things are gonna go a little bit more slowly uh, while the staff is on furlough because I'll be, because um, I'm the person who schedules everything. Um, but what, which, what are you interested in doing? Okay. Um, Ben Bailey asks, what's the best way to donate the website? And are things going to be, are there going to be any marketing initiatives to seek donations, promotions, special offers, et cetera? And I'll take this one too because, or no, let's Patrick, you take this one. Well, I mean, I will defer to you from a operation standpoint, what is the best way for folks to donate? Um, and does it depend on like what type of donation you're making? I, I, I don't know, Lisa, you might be the expert on. Yeah. Okay, well, so we do have a campaign going that Patrick mentioned, which is related to the COVID crisis. Um, and it's also focusing on building that sustaining uh, circle of donors who um, give a regular monthly contribution. And that is just a really helpful, healthy thing to do for this organization because we have um, ebbs and flows of revenue even in the good year. Um, and we often end up having to borrow. So, uh, you know, whatever we can do to increase the number of folks who give those smaller or even larger uh, monthly gifts, we love those. And you can do that on paper. You can do that by calling and we can call you back and, and handle your transaction over the phone. Or you can go to our website. We have um, a really easy to um, navigate. There's a donate button at the top of the website, pensacletheater.org. And there's a place for a recurring donation there, as well as a one-time donation. And you can make your gift in honor of somebody or in memory of somebody. It is a really um, easy, simple process and very secure. So um, please be reassured. And, and I think we initially started out with targeting those appeals to folks who have previously donated. Um, and so I, I do think that we will expand that um, as we go forward to get other people involved. Um, but like I said, like I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, we have gotten a really nice response already and we're anticipating an even more response and, and we definitely want to reach out to other individuals um, who maybe haven't donated in the past or who are looking for a way to make a difference for Pinnacle Theater to be a part of that sustainer circle. Okay, so more questions about the committees. Um, what were the names? So we have the out of the box group. Is there anything that we can deliver theater-wise right now? Um, and the other one is, what do we do to reopen? So who, how are we gonna address the facility? How are we gonna address the people safety? How are we going to address the communication? So those are the, um, the committees that we have going. Um, and then actually within the reopening one, there are three areas, which is the facility, the people, and communication. So if any of those are interesting to you, um, we can certainly look at that. I, I, yeah, so um, we already have uh, key committees plugged in on those things and uh, hospitality in particular. Um, so 
How can we support, help, and participate other than financially? Not everyone can give money right now, but could volunteer still. Um, so basically, it's working on those committees would be it. Um, participating in Liz Rogers' uh, Behind the Mask interviews would be another thing you could do. The best thing you can do is amplify us on social media. When we post one of those Behind the Mask episodes, share it out. Because what we don't want to do is disappear. Uh, during this time. And we recognize that right now it's, it's a very um, important time for the, our members of our black community, our, 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 all of our friends who need our support. So I, I, I recognize that there's some sensitivity there and that's something else we need to be taking on um, as we move forward. Um, and so there will be an opportunity to volunteer in that area as well, in the equity, diversity, and inclusion area. Um, and we, we, what I can do is, what I would recommend you do is uh, watch the Pinnacle Theater Community Facebook page, our group, and I will put information out there about what's the best way. And Robert wants to be on the out of the box committee. So let's see. Just now. Lisa? Um, Lisa? Yes, Liz. It's, it's, it's Liz. Sorry, I'm having trouble on my phone with the Q&A ask a question. Ask a question today. My, my question would be, if, if an actor or if a person had a submission for a one-person show or the reprise of a one- or two-person show, could that be submitted to the PRC? If there that's, was something that's where that was, it should go at this point, yes. Okay. The play reading committee is where those ideas should go for shows. Great. Um, so Heather Toller asked, have you considered any campaigns regarding the sustainer circle? And yes, you know, unfortunately, um, the timing was a little rough with um, what happened to George Floyd. And so I've kind of been taking a few beats. Um, but yes, we will be doing something on social media to answer that question. Um, and Heather asks, are the committees open to new members? And I, and I think I answered that already. Um, and this summer might be, might be looking to doing something for free, the public in the amphitheater at the park to keep our theater in the public eye. That's a good um, thought for the out of the box committee. How about that? How do we get in touch with the committees? Um, as I said, watch the Pentacle Theater Community Facebook group. Uh, what's the best way to donate? We already answered that one. Um, online streaming musical review as a fundraiser or we run into rights issues. Oh, this is a really good question. Okay, so I get lots of questions like this. So yes, you have to have rights to use music. Now a, a music review is a little less complicated than doing a musical um, in terms of the rights that we need. And we do have BMI and ASCAP licensing. Another question we get a lot is, oh, we made archive videos of X show, um, which technically should not exist. Um, and we do not have the rights to live stream plays that we've already recorded. Um, we've ceased that practice, but just that's a baseline thing, unless it's a public domain production. So we do um, need to be mindful of that. The other question we have about that is, do, does the audience want it? Do they want to pay for that? And so that we need to do some research with our audience uh, about that. Okay. Um, okay, so anybody else have another question? We're at 6.15 and I've either answered or we've answered most of the questions we've seen. So. No more questions? It's quiet. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna read something that Robert wrote in the chat. Liz, thank you for your work on the Behind the Mask pr productions. Mm -hmm. So since we've got a lot of people on the line, I'd like to uh, echo Robert's sentiment. Liz, thank you, and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. It's, it's amazing. And, 
And I have to tell you all on this call that your board president, Chris Fletcher, is amazing in her own right um, in terms of uh, her commitment to the financial health of the organization. I have worked here, you know, for over five years, and she is the most um, en en enthusiastic um, asker. Uh, that I've had the pleasure to work with. And I really, really appreciate that because it's gonna help us survive this time. Um, Marianne asks, the Sorted Lives reading was fantastic. Um, did we hear from them yet? We, they haven't closed the fundraiser yet. So if you do want to um, spread the word about that, um, again, even, even uh, Dell was a little quiet because of what was going on um, across the world. Uh, we know we're going to get a minimum of $2,700 from that event, maybe more. Go bid on um, Brother Boy's earrings um, and up, up that. Uh, Heather says, I know the musical decisions are public, but curious are the musical proposals still on the table for 2021? And the answer is we don't know. We just don't know if we're going to be able to do a musical. Lisa, I have one more yes. thing. Thanks. Um, I wanted to let everybody know, and please tell everyone you know as well, if you haven't heard from me yet about Behind the Mask and asking you for your interview, please, please, please don't take it personally. I am really backed up. I have uh, one that I'm editing, and I have one more in the can to edit, and I have about six people that I've spoken to that we're getting ready, that I'm getting ready to interview, but I, I want everybody. Um, so please just know that I, I will be in touch and please don't be shy about getting in touch with me if you would like to do it sooner than later. So uh, that's, that's it. Okay, uh, um, Chris Fletcher, would you like to wrap this up since it seems like our questions are done and uh, we did automatically record this. So at some point I will process it and get it up somewhere where you can see it. Um. Well, um, uh, I would like to wrap up by saying uh, uh, it's it's been a very interesting year to be president of Pinnacle Theater. Um, uh, but I think uh, everyone has really worked. I think the board members ha have done an extraordinary job this year and have worked very well together. And there's been no, ev everyone's been in agreement and uh, uh, it, it's just been, I, I find it to be a really rewarding uh, experience this year, though at times frustrating. Um, uh, we do plan to have some more conversation regarding Black Lives Matter, um, uh, it, maybe extending some things that, you know, talking out of the box about that as well, figuring out what, what we might be able to do as a community to uh, to assist with that, um, that will probably be a topic on our next uh, board meeting. I also want to thank the play reading committee. This has certainly been a, um, an interesting year for you as well. Um, really difficult to just keep, you know, staying on your toes for the next thing that happens. Uh, you've been doing a great job at that and and uh, I want you to know that we all uh, really appreciate it and I hope that we can come up with something that that will work for for everyone for 2021. It's going to be a challenge but uh, uh, I see everybody really pitching in and and helping out so um, I'm I'm really proud of of our our entire community this year. So thank you so very much, everyone who's participating in this, and the board and the play reading committee. And I, I applaud uh, uh, everyone this year for being able to uh, 
go with the flow. And I just want to put a little pitch in for my team who've been very understanding. Oh, and it's, I'm sorry, Lisa. Yeah. Staff has been very accommodating this yeah. year and has worked really, really hard to to make some concessions. And uh, 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 we we want to thank them wholeheartedly. Uh, uh, Sarah, Julia, Chris, uh, Lisa, and uh, uh, David. Uh, David have have all uh, worked really hard to to figure out a way to keep us going. So uh, much appreciation there as well. Thank you. Luke. Okay, so we were get, we're still getting good comments, but Scott Hosner, I see you, <laughs> and yes, okay. Well, I'll reach out. And uh, thank you, uh, Ed says, thank you, Chris Fletcher, for working so hard as president to keep our theater thriving. And thank you, board and committee members, for being the heartbeat of our theater during this difficult time. I'm grateful. Thank you, Ed. And then Pamela suggests a one act in the park that addresses implicit bias and racism. So there you go. Ooh. I think you got somebody to talk to at your house. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, Keep the conversation going. Let me know if you need anything. And if we want to do another town hall, I'm also interested in hearing about that. Sounds right. great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.